The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you out here in the uh, congregation and all all of you who are out there online watching. Um, glad to have you this morning. Well, we're excited about what God is doing here and what God is doing in the church world. And um, he is always working. He's always working, even when we don't see what he's doing. And a lot of times he's working behind the scenes. And then all of a sudden something happens, like when the curtain opens on a stage and you see all of these things and you can see more of the complete picture. And God really does order our steps, but it, our steps aren't always dramatic at the time, but when we look back, we can see what God has done. So the message this morning is one that's been on my heart for a long time, um, the Gospel of John, and the name of the message this morning is Community, God's Design for Growth. Now the central thought in the Bible is life and building, but you know the old saying, you, sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. I'm really big on total concept because we do get lost in the details and we don't see the overall picture. We don't see total concept. Now Merriam-Webster says community is a unified body of individuals, a unified body of individuals. And as Dennis has said, Many times, it's harder to live around real people than it is to have a concept like, I'm praying for the missionaries in China. Well, you know you're never going to be with those missionaries. In all probability, they're not going to um, cross you in any way. They don't... It really it takes actually something going on to rough the to smooth the rough edges off us living stones. God is real. God is practical. God wants to work things in us and out of us in the reality of daily life. Now, back in 2008, and I understand it now better than I did at the time, um, God spoke to three people, Dennis, me, and another man who was in the congregation and he gave us the same thing in the same week. He said, I'm going to start building my house now, my church now. And there was a CD set called Heavenly House that we did when all three of us shared what God had spoken to us. I think it's now on the clearance section on the um, website. But I may need to go back and listen to that to listen to those messages because it's very significant. What I didn't understand was that in 2008 some very significant things were set in motion. Uh, Bishop Bill Hammond has recently written a book on what was going to begin happening in 2008 and the prophets are speaking. God is seriously doing something with his church now and even though it may be starting small, and God often starts with in small and insignificant ways, at least they're small and insignificant to us, God is working. And when we moved to this building in 2008, he spoke to us and said, you're not a church. He said, I want you to create an upper room to birth a church. Now, that, of course, the bells went off for me because we know what God did originally to birth a church. And then in 2009, I saw a vision as though I were looking down on the whole globe, like from outer space, and I saw explosions, little groups of believers all over the entire earth. And there were explosions as the fire of God hit, and there were 
little Pentecost. And one thing a church leader once said that caught my attention was he had once thought that um, you go into a city and you get all the shepherds and the pastors in that city to cooperate and be unified. And over time he learned you can't really get a large group of people to live in unity. He said, if you can get, as Jesus said, if you can get two people or even three, Jesus says, there I am in the midst of them. One accord, real heart knittings. It's a spiritual entity. Now, we can have heart knittings with the people in this room, but we also have heart knittings with, with our people that we know are faithfully connected with this ministry from around the world. We have heart knittings with our family members and other dear friends. Vicki was telling me that um, she met a missionary that she'd known in the, on the mission field in the Amazon, hadn't seen her for 20 years, and it was like they'd never been, they'd never been apart. So, um, but real unity is something real. It's not project unity, like they'll have mission trips and groups of believers will gather together and they'll go someplace and help build a church and then they'll come back and go their separate ways. That's project unity. But God's after heart unity. Now, when I saw those glory explosions all over the earth, the whole earth began to glow gold. And we know that represents the glory of God. And the glory of God really did in this vision cover the whole earth as the waters cover the sea and we are we are heading quickly toward a glory movement because because where God is where God dwells there's his glory because glory is part of God's essence the radiant shining forth of his presence is the glory and we know of course what happened to Moses when he was called up to God's glory, that it so saturated him and permeated him that his, the skin of his face shined so much that he had to cover it because, because people were afraid to look at him. Does that kind of make you think of the pictures of the saints in the old, old um, paintings of the first century church, how they drew halos, golden halos, like flat gold plates behind their heads as a representation of the glory that people saw shining from them. Now what God wants is the genuine. He wants genuine heart knittings between believers. He wants us to get our rough edges ground off in the friction of daily life, and he wants us to be transformed. Now the central thought of the Bible is life and building. The central thought of the Gospel of John is life and building. You see, Jesus builds his church with the life he has produced in us. He can use our gifts, but he doesn't build his house with our gifts. I mean, he gave a donkey the ability to speak in Hebrew, I suppose, and yet he didn't build anything with that donkey. And that's, gifts are nothing to God. That, he, just, he just gives them. The Holy Spirit gives gifts. But it's in the grind of daily life that we experience inner transformation. And if you haven't heard this message or read the booklet, I suggest we have DVD and CD, The Humanity of the Divine Jesus. And we have a booklet available too because that is what is important right now. You see, Jesus lived in his humanity for 30-some years before he ever began his short ministry of three years or so. Jesus walked it out in his daily life. And do you know what Jesus' emotions were? The fruit of the Spirit as a reality. God wants the fruit of the Spirit developed in our daily life. See, he can't build with our flesh. He can only build with life, the transformation that he's worked in us through our daily life, through the work of the cross, through denying ourselves for 
quickly forgiving so that we don't stew on negative emotions. Now, I want to read you a couple of verses, and one of these verses is the, the verse that God gave us for this particular fellowship of believers. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, and I think this is very significant. It is a now verse for where we live and when we live right now. Speaking to believers, Paul says, You are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. God wants community. It's his design for growth. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone in whom in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Verse 22. In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now, up until verse 22, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place in the Spirit, Paul is speaking of the universal church. And one day you know that genuine believers will be brought and part of a universal church as a complete whole. All the believers who believed over the centuries are in that universal church as well as believers who are living now. Verse 22, however, is not speaking of individual growth. It's not speaking of universal growth. It's speaking of the local churches, these little upper rooms that are being prepared now and others in whom you also are being built together. Stones fitted together, living stones, stones with life in them, being fitted together, who will be unified and become a dwelling place of God in the Spirit or a habitation of God in the Spirit. We're prepared. Any, who in here read um, any of Tommy Tenney's book, The God Chasers, the people who were hungry for God, who wanted God to come? Well, you know what? The church isn't making much of an impact in the world because the church is pretty powerless compared to God. God wants to come and take over. And then he will work through us as a living organism to accomplish what he wants to accomplish in the world. That's pretty much what happened under John Wesley, which is a signpost we can look back to. What can happen if believers are so filled with God? Oh, and the Moravians before them, what can happen with believers come into so much one accord that they create a portal so the glory of God can come and God himself can come dwell in their midst? Well, the Moravians, it was a hundred years of day and night worship and prayer. They launched a missionary movement to the entire world. And then John Wesley comes along and emulates them. And the believers that have been transformed by God through the life of God in them went forth into where God called them into their communities. And it was men didn't plan it. Nobody had a um, business plan for this. Nobody specifically orchestrated it and said, go here and go there. They simply were obedient. And in their obedience to take their Christianity out of the building and into the community, into politics, into the stores, into business, as well as the home, where they built orphanages, they built hospitals, they built schools, and they, tran oh, they changed the economy of a nation. They transformed an entire nation in one generation. And we talk about, well, I don't, I've heard it ever since um, I was saved, to take our city for Christ. Um, take our um, state, take our nation for Jesus. Well, they really did it. They really did it. That's how society gets transformed, through transformed individuals who go out and make a difference and take their Christianity with them. See, we're going to be built together, but later we're going to be sent out. Now, Jesus said, I will build my church in Matthew 16, 18. 
What is a church? It's an assembly of called out ones. What are we called out of? We're called out of the world and we're brought in to assemble together. A congregation. And with the life that Jesus has managed to cause to spring up in us, then he builds us together because we become a living organism. A church built by Jesus, a fellowship built by Jesus requires community, an organism of individuals connected by the bond of peace. Now, you know that, well, let me tell you what bond really means. The word bond actually means ligament, like ligaments that connect bones together. So Jesus takes this bunch of loose heaped up bones or living stones, because bone is actually living stone. It's living. It has marrow in it. All these disconnected bones and the bond of peace connects them together. So they function properly. This is the same word that it's used for a physician who sets a bone or snaps a joint that's out of place back into line. The bond of peace. A church built by Jesus is like the early church. And if you look back through history, very few churches have existed over the past 2,000 years that look and function like the early church. Now, the first time I went to church, I had I'd gotten saved, and then I knew I didn't want to go to a, a church that taught liberal things and, and ridiculousness like the stuff I was taught in Sunday school. I wanted a church that really believed the Bible and taught the Bible. I was taught things like, well, when Abraham, this was in my Sunday school, when Abraham went up the mountain to sacrifice Isaac, well, that, was, that just represents when people realized human sacrifice was wrong. Well, I'm glad none of that stuck because as soon as I got saved, I wanted a Bible-believing church and I knew that God's word was holy and God who was all-powerful would get his word to us the way he wanted it. It would be written the way he wanted it and it was too important that he not get it to us. Now, translations can mess it up but because that's why we should maybe look at several translations and maybe even consider, well, what is the Hebrew word here? What's the Greek word here when we're studying? Now, the book of Ephesians is the Alps, the high peaks of the New Testament. This is a church that made it. This is a church where all things were functioning properly. It's the most wonderful depiction of a church, of an early church that worked to me, in the entire Bible. And Ephesus was a pretty bad place to live, let me tell you. But Paul says in Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, to the believers in this um, mountaintop church, this example of a church, he said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's the word ligaments. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And in Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, he says, And Jesus himself gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip you for the work of the ministry. Why work of the ministry? For what purpose? For the building up, putting together of the body of Messiah till we come to the unity of the faith and knowing the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Messiah. That's what we're working toward. We want to be like Jesus. We want to function like Jesus, but we want it reality in the spirit. Transformed people. So life and building, life and building. Genesis begins with life and building materials. The book of Revelation 
ends with life and a completed building for somewhere in eternity future, the new Jerusalem. It's a building made up of people who have been transformed into living stones like precious gems, not just a, a little rock that you pick up on the riverbed. Precious stones. We're living stones, but Jesus wants to transform us into precious stones. In Genesis, God also placed the tree of life in the garden. It is, isn't it amazing that when God gives a test, he's already given the answer? I mean, he put Adam right in front of, front of the tree. And he and Eve ate from the wrong tree. It was like in the Old Testament where it says, I have placed before you life and death. I suggest you choose life. We are not fast learners sometimes, I do believe. After God prepared a garden with a tree of life, a river, and a building materials, he placed Adam, a man he had formed, out of clay in the garden. Now, Adam, the word Adam, is the Hebrew word yatser, and it means to fashion as a potter. Eve was made using a word, bana, B-A-N-A-H, meaning to build. God took a rib out of Adam's side and used it to build him a wife named Eve. The man was formed, but the Adam was built. In Genesis 2, we see life materials that proceed out of the flow of life, which are precious stones, and the building of a wife. It's a picture of Messiah and his church, his bride. The book of Revelation ends with the fullness of life and a complete building. And he carried me away in the spirit, this is Revelation 21, to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the name of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones, living stones. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. The city of the street of the city was pure gold. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and his Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of sun or moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And then in Revelation 22, again, you see a pure river of water of life. And there we see the tree of life, all the way from Genesis to Revelation. It's a complete, tells a complete story. We see a completed bride and a building, a city, the New Jerusalem, made up of all the saints from the day of Pentecost on who chose to follow the Lamb. Now, there's a bridge of time in the Bible because, you know, time was created. It started in the beginning of Genesis. When it says in the beginning, it's talking about when time was set in motion because we have eternity past, we have eternity future, and then we have something God created that also contains what we call time. Between Genesis and Revelation, the two ends of the Bible, there's a huge gap, a broad span. It would be easy to get lost in all the details and history and this happened and that happened and all the begats and all the stuff in the Bible, um, some of which we enjoy more than others. On this bridge of time, from the beginning to the end of the Bible, God accomplishes five things that span the scriptures from beginning to end. These five things are creation, the incarnation of Jesus, redemption, the anointing by a dove, the Holy Spirit, 
which also um, references Pentecost, and the building of a house for God. Where is the house? The psalmist cries out. God cries out, where is the house that you will build for me? Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool, but where is my house? Well, that's one thing that we're dedicated to. And if you want to read a dream that I had, the last chapter, the epilogue in the ancient blueprint tells about a dream that I had of the glorious church. Now, what's the bridge connecting these two, in a sense? Well, as far as what's written in the Bible, the Gospel of John is a bridge that pulls it all together and explains it in one short gospel. It's a bridge between the beginning and end of the Bible. It's not a synoptic gospel. I've heard it called a maverick gospel. But John sums it all up for us. Now, the Gospel of John particularly covers life and building like no other book in the Bible. And within the Gospel of John itself, we see a bridge of time. The first chapter of John reveals the two sections of eternity, eternity past and eternity future. It begins with eternity past and eternity future, where humanity future will be God's dwelling place, the new Jerusalem. Humanity itself is where God wants to live. I will be your God and you will be my children. How many times do we read that in the prophets? And John gives an overview. The, whole, the key to the whole Bible is condensed into this book. The book of John is also a microcosm of the Bible covering all five of God's accomplishments. The first chapter, then, is a synopsis of the entire gospel. And in it we see creation, incarnation of Jesus, redemption, the anointing by a dove, and the beginning of the building of a house for God. Now, John begins with these. John 1, 1 through 5. And to me, this was very hard to understand when I was a new believer. And I'm going to lay it all out for you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Let's start with in the beginning. In Genesis, in the beginning means the beginning of created time, the beginning of creation. It was the beginning of what God made of the physical universe. But in the beginning here, looks back to eternity past, when there was nothing but only God. Eternity without a beginning or end. John was a very special person as far as God was concerned. He was the, he wrote the last gospel. He wrote the last book of the Bible. He wrote the last epistle. Now, Peter was called when he was fishing, and Jesus said, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And Peter became a, an evangelist who had the keys of heaven, heaven and opened the kingdom of heaven, the heavens, for both Jew and Gentile. By the time John wrote his epistles and gospel and the book of Revelation. It was a sad sight to see what had begun as the wonderful, glorious church. The enemy had really worked over. By the time John wrote, the church was degraded and had become corrupt, had been damaged by religious concepts, Greek philosophy, heresies, doctrines, and false teachings. And so one thing that began to happen was the, um, well, it had begun in the gospel somewhat in the book of Acts. People began to defend the faith. 
they began to say, this is what we believe. This is what Christians believe. And that's wrong, and this is right. And they begin to give what we call creedal statements. A creed comes from the word credo, which means I believe. And we have throughout history, we have many creeds. We have the um, Old Roman Creed, we have the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedonian Creed, the Athanasian Creed. And all these were written at key times in history where the truth of the gospel was being challenged in very key elements. So the church had been damaged. John was called when he was mending nets. John was called as one to mend the holes in the nets. They were caused by people's flesh, divisions, and heresies. Mending restores something to a condition that was present at the beginning. We must be brought back to the beginning where there is life and love only. In the very beginning, before there was anything but God, we had our God is three in one, in perfect unity. And there was only life and only love. When John, in the book of Revelation, called the seven churches to repentance, he told that the Ephesian church, was the, which was the height of possibility for church life, he said, you've lost your first love. Repent. The messages to the seven churches written by John were calls for repentance, mending what had been degraded and corrupt. Go back to the beginning. Go back to the very beginning when there was only God. This is what, this is our standard. This is what we must look to. And then, of course, John in his uh, first letter talked about the three levels of Christians. I speak to you children for you have forgiveness. I speak to you young men because you are strong and have overcome the wicked one. And then I speak to you fathers for you have known him who was from the beginning. We need to have his attributes in his heart. Now, the word. I was puzzled by a new believer by the use of word in these verses. I thought, why doesn't he say Jesus or Messiah? You know, the word. I just couldn't really get that at first. What is a word? What is this word? The word in this verse is the definition of the explanation, and the expression of God. Now, God was mysterious and hidden throughout history until Jesus came on the scene. Now, a few isolated individuals stand out for their relationship with God, but as for the average person, who, who is this God? You know, I don't know him. I don't know what he's like. But because this hidden, mysterious God, Father God, wanted man to know him, because he is love, he is life, he sent his word in the form of his son to us so we could see what the Father really is and how he really loves. Walking on this earth. How amazing. He sent his only begotten son to represent him on earth, to be his word spoken to man. This is what your God is like. A God so close, they touched his hands. It says in 1 John, the epistle, it says, we touched him, we spoke with him, we fellowshiped with him, we got to know him, we experienced him. God sent his word to us. Now, the more a person talks, we get to know what's hidden inside them, right? What's deep within us is revealed by our words, what we say. And part of what we say is also by our actions, what we do. A word is a thought expressed. Now, for us human beings, as soon as we speak, our words are separate from us. Here's what we've spoken, here's what we've written, and here we are. They contain thoughts, but they aren't necessarily the essence of who we are. 
And now I say aren't necessarily because the anointing that was on those words that were written or those words that were spoken when we listen to a message, there can be an anointing carried on those words, but it's still not who we are. Jesus as the Word is the declaration, manifestation, and expression of who God is. He himself, his very life essence is in his words. His word is not separate from who he is. That's why when we read the scriptures, Jesus, uh, Dennis says, think, drink, don't think, and feed, don't read. Do you know as you read your Bible, instead of reading it with your head and your mental understanding, if while you're reading, you continually drink in, you're drinking in the essence of Jesus because his word is living. And I had not done that. I hadn't even thought of that. You know, although you, when you read, you're open in your spirit. But I've started actively doing that now, drinking in, because that way he is becomes part of our nature as we read. He's the living word, Hebrews 4, 12 through 13. When Jesus speaks, his words are living. The words of the Bible are living. They're meant to be read with our spirit, not just our head. A once hidden and mysterious God walked the earth as the best man who ever lived. He was divinely human. He was son of God and son of man. Suddenly we have the life-giving spirit of Jesus, humanity meshed with divinity. And when Jesus ascended, he poured out his spirit upon us. Now he's seated in heavenly places, yet he's still here with us, living in us, living through us. Once God was unknown, now he's revealed through living epistles, not just Jesus. Jesus is more than just God. He is the revealed God. Now what does it mean, the word with God? Jesus as the word was both with God and was God. Jesus was never separate from God. The word was and always will be with Father God. So, when his word comes, God comes. When the word is present, God is present. Now, how are Messiah, God, and the Holy Spirit three in one? We sing that song, by the way, that song, I Believe, which is a creedal song that says our God is three in one. How can this be reconciled? How can two or even three persons of the Trinity be one. Our God is three in one because of the perfect unity in the Godhead. Everyone cooperates. Everyone's heart is the same. And God is three in one because of perfect unity made possible in the Spirit. By the way, we can never have oneness with God in our flesh. I mean, our flesh needs to, to go to the cross. It's only through our spirit and the areas in our life have been, that have been transformed by the spirit. A rock and a tree can never be one, but spirits can interpenetrate. They can mix. They can mingle with one another. They can be mingled together. That's why in the meal offering, the oil was kneaded into the dough, is made part of the dough. And by the way, that's what Jesus wants in our life. He doesn't want to just pour oil on top of the bread. He wants the oil mixed so it becomes more and more of our human nature. And John 14, and I will eventually get to John 14, 19 and 23, Jesus is explaining it all to the sometimes slow disciples. A little while longer and the world will see. He's telling them he's going to go away, but he's not going to go away. He says, a little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see because I live, 
you will live also, and at that day you will know and understand that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And then in verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. And how is this possible? Because we are joined in the Spirit. We're living on earth, but we are joined to Jesus. We've been made to sit in heavenly places in Jesus. The Word with God. Now the Word was God. This is the secret for understanding the whole Gospel of John. The Word was God. John said to Nicodemus, No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended out of heaven, the Son of Man who is in heaven. He is both here and there because he is omnipresent. There is no distance in the Spirit. That's why we can be praying for someone in another part of the world and our spirit, the anointing from our spirit can touch them. There's no distance. We could pray for somebody Say the missionaries in China. Say we knew a missionary in China. We can be praying for that missionary and they can feel our prayer oftentimes. A lot of times when you feel anointing and you don't know what, what it has to do with, it might be that someone is praying for you. He is both here and there. He's omnipresent. As we will cover later, Jesus opened up a portal connecting heaven and earth, and it's never been shut on the heaven side. However, there is a problem. We need to come into one accord, which opens up that portal so he can ascend. We, we read um, in the Old Testament that the Lord inhabits our praises. Well, he does inhabit them if we let him. And the requirement for that is coming into one accord, creating a portal so he can come and dwell. Because of Jesus, we can be on earth and we can be in a heavenly kingdom. Ephesians 2, 5 through 6 says, Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive with Messiah, Father God did, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Messiah Jesus. It's already been done. Now, we know that we don't get everything the day we're saved. That's, we have to walk things out and we have to appropriate what is already our inheritance so it becomes real to us. We don't want theory. We want reality. The Word was God. The Word is the creator. The creation of the physical universe came through the living Word when He spoke. John 1, verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And I just love this. This makes my heart sing. This is the amplified, classic Amplified translation. Hebrews 1, 2 through 3. And when, when we were working on the Supernatural Power of Peace book, oh, all that Jesus is, all that his peace means was, was just absolutely amazing. I wish everybody could understand the super power, supernatural power of the peace of Jesus. And he gave it to us as a gift. He never takes it away. So if we lose our peace, we're the one who walked away temporarily. Hebrews 1, 2 through 3. But in the last of these days... Father God has spoken to us in the person of a son whom he appointed heir and lawful owner of all things also by and through whom he created the worlds and the reaches of space and the ages of time. He made, produced, built, operated, and arranged them in order. He is the sole expression of the glory of God, the light being, the outraying or radiance of the divine. And he is the perfect imprint and very image of God's nature. 
upholding, maintaining, and guiding and propelling the universe by his mighty word of power. This is the living word. This is the one that we love and serve. And do you know, he's never stopped speaking. And if he ever did stop speaking, the universe would fly apart and the particles would disintegrate. Jesus is holding all things together by the word he's continually speaking forth. Wow, if he can do that in the universe, what can he do in our lives if we surrender? The word is life. The most important point is life. John 1, 4. In him was life. Why did Jesus create all things before he came to earth as life? Let me ask that again. Why did Jesus create all things before he came to earth as life? Because for him to be received as life, he needed a receiver, a container, something to impart life into. Before he came to be life, he created the heavens and the earth and man with a spirit to receive him. See, we're, we're kind of different in all the created universe because God gave us something unique. Remember, remember, it says that he spoke the animals and the plants and all these things into existence, but he did something unique with man. He breathed into man the spirit of life, the spirit of divine life. He made us, and the science of it is fascinating. It's in the Divine Healer book. I talk about this. It's just amazing that scientists are studying now deep spiritual experiences. And the bottom line, and this is a neuroscientist, guys. This is a neuroscientist. And they don't tend to be warm and fuzzy. He has discovered that something unique happens in our brains when we get lost in prayer. And his bottom line was, God created mankind with a unique capacity, a unique spiritual capacity to discover God and to know God. Animals don't have that. Animals have souls, which is mind, will, and emotions, but they do not have spirits because God wanted to be found by us. God wants us to seek him and find him. He made us for that. He made us with the spiritual equipment so that can happen. Only Jesus gives life. Everything apart from Jesus, everything apart from God is death. Remember? The devil took over the world. The prince of the power of the air rules. Everything that we seek after apart from God is death, and it brings death. Um, the Apostle Paul said, all these things I once considered important, you know, my studies, my titles and all this, it's dumb. It's refuse. It's worse, worse than worthless. It's stinking dumb. And then we read the Song of Solomon and all that he had, and his wealth and his wisdom and all this, and he said, everything apart from God is vanity. It's empty. It's full of death. Jesus talked to the Pharisees and called them whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. It's actually worse than empty. It's full of death. Jesus wants us to be so enamored of him that truly the world becomes dim in the glory of his radiance, that everything will become dim. I had an experience one time. We were at the mall, and um, all the noises and the lights and the people chattering and all that, and I saw it as though it were a dream. I saw it. It's kind of transparent almost, that it's illusory, that it's going to be, this is going to fade away. 
It's meaningless. It's shallow. And like Solomon, it is vanity. It really is empty when we compare it with the life that's in Jesus, the life that we could have, the life that we're seeking after, the life that we're um, meeting down here on Tuesday nights, waiting for God, saying, God, we've got to have more, more of you, more of your life. We want your glory. We can't have life apart from Jesus. There's no life in the things that many Christians seek after. There's no life in a lot of our churches and our programs and our rituals and traditions. There's no life apart from Jesus. We should be praying and I pray, God, I, I really want to take this seriously. And I've asked God to be ruthless and relentless with me. Because you see, not everybody is going to make it through the door of the wedding feast. That always bothered me, the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. They looked exactly alike. They were all called virgins. They were all expecting going into the wedding feast. And five wise went in, and the five foolish went out. Now it says that they have, we know that when we're saved, our lamp is burning within us. But then we have a soul, and the virgins all had extra vessels, which would be the soul, but five didn't have enough oil. That oil that's mixed into us is the only thing that counts. They didn't have enough oil. They hadn't let Jesus transform them to make them suitable. In the, in the Revelation, it says, I saw the holy city of the new Jerusalem, and it says, and his wife, coming down for the wedding feast, and his wife has made herself ready. So I'm saying, God, I really want to be in that number. I know we're, you know, we're all of us going to be with Jesus for all eternity, but I don't want to be one and have the door shut in my face. I want to be ready enough. Well, how much is ready enough? I don't know, but God be ruthless and relentless with me. I don't want anything that would separate me from you. And you know, we can look at all look at ourselves and see the junk in our lives. But if we concentrate on Jesus and say, Jesus, I really want you more than anything else, and I give you permission to work in my life, you know, he'll be faithful to do that. So it's all about surrendering to him. Now, the final point is life is the light of men. Now, I don't know about you, but as soon as I was saved, I saw things differently. I instantly saw that abortion was murdering babies and was horrible, horrible, horrible. I understood so much of this is what Jesus is all about. This is how we're meant to live. This is, um, this is the only thing on earth that matters. I was enthralled with God in the Bible and I cherished my Bible not really understanding, but I instantly knew that it was the infallible Word of God and that He would get us His Word in the right form. Now, I'll tell you, there's some things that are hard to understand and some things you will only understand if you understand the Hebrew and Greek because the Bible can be simple, but it can also be very profound. God enlightened me by His life living in me. Life is the light of men. I even thought the sky looked bluer and the grass looked greener. It was amazing. All the colors, it's like everything had been muddied before, but now it's bright and clear. It was because of the light of his life in me. John 1, 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. When we're saved, we receive Jesus as divine life, and we receive light. Now, our light can grow. We can grow in our understanding. We can grow in our recognition of right and wrong. We can, uh, because God starts at the big things, but he doesn't stop, and he'll get down to the little things and give us more light when we're willing. Our understanding of God in the whole world is changed because of his light. 
in Amazing Grace, that hymn that everybody seems to love so much, uh, the writer of the hymn says, I was blind, but now I see. Well, he even wants to remove any blindness that's left in us. He wants to take us to such bright light that we're in his glory. And one thing we need to understand, that the brighter the light shines, the more we see. Have you ever seen a room that looked clean and you cleaned and dusted it, and then a ray of sunlight comes in and you see the particles of dust still floating in the air? Of course, we can't do anything about that, but we can do something about it in our lives, that the brighter the light, the better we see. The light shined in our darkness. The light continues to shine in our darkness. When we receive Jesus as the expression of a God, he becomes our life, and his light becomes the light that shines in us. And what are we told by the words of Jesus? That we're to let that light that is in us shine in the world and not be hidden, that people will see it and glorify our Father who's in heaven. People see the light that's coming from our lives. The old creation had physical light, but for the new creation, it's the light of God's life. Let me read that verse again. John 1, verses 1 through 5, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not and still does not comprehend it. The book of John is a book of allegories. We see several allegories here. With John, one calls, when John calls Jesus the Word, it tells what Messiah means for God because Jesus speaks, he's able to reveal a God who is otherwise hidden and, and mysterious. Now, we personally are containers for God on earth. Jesus doesn't have just, there wasn't just a temple in Jerusalem and with Jesus the temple. Now we are containers for God. We are representatives. We are ambassadors. Our lives matter. They matter very much through God. What could God do with a human life fully surrendered? Just as Jesus was surrendered to do the will of his Father, but us surrendered to do the will of the Father. Is there not a cause on earth? Is there not a cause? Are there not things that need to be done that only God can do? We need to get out of the way and let God work through us to come into the darkness of the world and to change things. Paul said, present your bodies a living sacrifice just as Jesus did. And that's been my prayer for years. Lord, work through me. Get me out of the way. Make me your living sacrifice. Is there not a cause? Now on Tuesday evenings, we come together, meet here in this building for a now word that God is speaking to us as a congregation, an assembly of believers what is God speaking to us as a group? His words are precious. They have life on them. They enlighten us. They give us life. And because they are living, if we value them, take them to heart and let them get planted in us, they will grow and increase. Community, God's design for growth, for the building up of the body, for the building of a house for God. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. 
For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.